everyone, this is Anita Ratnam and here are my thoughts for the month of October about the world of Indian dance. Anita says, each month I have shared my thoughts and views on various events and issues that relate to the global world of Indian dance. This portal that started as a phone directory has grown to become so much more for a whole new generation. In spite of being a multi-hyphenate artist, I realize the enormous new energy that is surrounding us at every turn. As much as I would like to imagine that I can keep up with the rapid changes afoot in every phase of our artistic lives, it is clear that there is a generation divide and I cannot morph or reinvent endlessly to keep pace with a blur of hyperactivity. It is confusing, confounding, but it's also a certainty. What do young dancers want to hear, watch, listen and read? The foremost goal is to dance, to perform, to share, to shine and to smile in the glow of the spotlight. The opportunities seem to have exploded, but is this a bubble? Is social media giving us the illusion of change like a shimmering chimera, while the ground reality is much the same? Yet, we turn to our social media handles to verify one's identity and it is the new calling card. Like it or not, we are now an algorithm to a giant robot sitting somewhere in Silicon Valley. And there are several young Indian dancers in the US who don't know who I am and who are not familiar with Nataki, this platform. Smack on the face. There goes my ego. While I ponder on that, let me continue. Nataraja presides over a global meet. He stands tall and imposing like a silent sentinel in the iconic pose with a raised left leg. The giant 28 foot tall statue of Shiva Nataraja weighing 19 tons was transported on a giant truck from Swami Malay in Tamil Nadu to be installed outside the new Bharat Mandabam in New Delhi where the G20 summit was held. Created by the sons of the award-winning sculptor Sthapati Deva Senapati, the image brought a smile to the face of many dancers. In which other culture is there the god of dance? And now the most powerful of the world leaders have entered the summit meeting in the circle of Shiva's gaze. It was India's moment, along with the successful launch of the Chandrayaan 2 to the moon last month, India has made repeated headlines around the world, never mind a pouting Canadian leader who acted like a spoiled child and a negative Western press who doubted the capacity of the world's largest democracy. Never mind the inconvenience to New Delhi residents and traffic snafus. It was a giant diplomatic, economic, PR and cultural coup. Of course, there were numerous music and dance shows, a brilliant fashion show, but it did not feature the earlier model of classical soloists presented in a private audience for world leaders. This time, it was folk and rural arts that dominated with their infectious energy and gusto. Much of the staging was as background effect as dignitaries entered and socialized and networked the mandate was to showcase India's soft power and it was mostly achieved through the large number of artists as spectacle. Bye, bye, bye. Speaking of spectacle, the Nita Mukesh Ambani Cultural Center, NMACC, has seen the successful return of its homegrown musical epic from civilization to nation sold out shows for all three weeks and the announcement of the popular ABBA hit show Mamma Mia, which will follow, only cements my statements made repeatedly over the last several months. Big groups, large numbers, eye-catching staging, culture as spectacular family entertainment! Exclamation! 
This formula has seeped into the classical dance scene. Chennai's Madurai Murli Dharan, who's the darling of the NRI world, has mounted his newest spectacle, Vayu Putra, in the US, involving 10 different dance schools. From a conceptual point of view, it is a win-win formula. 10 schools, their students, their gurus, parents are all a certain buy-in for sold-out shows. Ticket sales are guaranteed. Houseful boards inevitable. But it is the uneven nature of the choreographic styles that can be pondered upon. But when a pattern is working so well, why fuss with it? With the Navaratri season upon us, the Garba dancers are now warming up to step into the spotlight. The US Garba network is now fully professionalized with an enthusiastic community participating from all Indian and mainstream communities. Contemporary dancer Parijat Desai has been teaching Garba inspired sessions in her titles Dancing in the Round. I don't see, however, the same pattern with other Indian folk forms. Bhangra, Kolatam, Ghumar, they are also very popular community dances, but the respective communities have not come together to broaden their appeal for the next generation. What does group dancing demand? In the folk world, the original impetus was seasonal. Harvest, weddings, births, it was a time to come together to gather and celebrate. Skill, speed, agility were not paramount, as it has become with all urban classical dance today. So I'm actually leading to the question, should dance teachers learn and teach the art of large group choreographies as a special skill? I mention here the success of the young neoclassical group from Hyderabad, Aina Dance Company. They do not figure in any of the serious Sabha calendars, yet their own calendars are full with 25 shows a month. This 30 member group of 20, 30 somethings live and work together and they earn a living by dancing, not teaching. They are busy at private events and even temple festivals where large crowds gather. Nobody took them seriously seven years ago and now they have a stellar social media presence with a considerable fan following. Their group choreographies are exacting, beautifully synchronized. Their training methodology has been developed over months and years without outside interventions. An interesting pedagogical case study for anyone interested in following the emerging trends of neoclassical dance in India. My right or yours? Whose right is it? With the dance and music scene upon us, there is one important factor that dancers, musicians, composers, sound recordists and choreographers must keep in mind. The issue of copyright. Since the lockdown and the surge in digital dance programming, there are new and fresh situations that have emerged. The paramount issue I wish to highlight now is the right of an idea. If person A gives an idea to person B, and artist B fleshes out the idea into a full concept of movement, music and choreography, then the copyright rests with person B, not A. An idea, no matter how brilliant, cannot be copyrighted. Neither can historical and mythological characters. In the absence of a written agreement between producer, presenter and creator, the person who has given life and creative expression to the original idea owns the copyright. That's right. The person who has given flesh and life to the idea owns the copyright. These issues emerge when a multi-style, multi-artist production is presented. The producer or production entity may own the copyright of the entire production in its sequencing and arrangement, but in the absence of a written agreement between producer and each artist, the ownership of that particular segment belongs to the individual artist. These are some of the newer and fresher challenges 
that have appeared. And the Indian mentality in the dance world continues to evade and skim over the nitty gritty and fine print in this minefield. India is now the company of outer space copyright. That's right. So does India have rights on the southern side of the moon where Chandrayaan 2 has landed? Does the US, who were the first to land on the moon's surface, have an all over copyright of the moon? While this has been discussed, it has now been decided that the moon is for humanity and not for individual countries. Crowd control. The stampede and subsequent chaos that resulted in the disaster of the mismanaged A.R. Rahman musical concert is a lesson for event managers and fans. The event made headlines for all the wrong reasons. There were heartwarming reports of large crowds standing patiently to enter the giant auditoriums in Moscow and St. Petersburg for the opening of the Festival of India shows. Of course, there will be nothing like that for the dance even during the Chennai music season. Karnataka and Hindustani musicians, however, still command a certain level of excitement and a following in India. Fan clubs that comment endlessly on the merits of their favorite singer, expanding on a certain raga in comparison to another, fill the screens of X, formerly Twitter. We can still see long lines outside auditorium in December when the season tickets for music concerts for some stars are sold. But this is only for vocal music. Expanding audiences and spaces. As performers also become curators, it is exciting to see an event come together through a different lens. The restaurant Craft Retail became the focal point for a two-day event titled Textures of Traditions, located in the heart of Chennai's Nandanam metro station complex. Classical hereditary folk artists shared space with craftspeople and students. The multi-genre presentation struck all the right chords of the new nomenclatures of cultural ecology, diversity, equity, inclusion. I saw mostly new faces with very few dancers in the audience mix. And rightly so. Chennai's dance community is hardly one where performers are generous and curious. They mostly keep in their own silos and circles. So Textures of Tradition was created and targeted to unshackle the performing arts from the elitism, spaces of auditoriums and class distinctions. My own 90-minute session was a mixed bag. Provoking dancers and non-dancers to move in a restaurant space complete with chairs and a staircase was a challenge. To break down the exercises into bite-sized instructions to remind classical dancers not to sink into known adavus and vocabulary, to observe the shapes and contours of every part of their environment and then begin to create three to five second movement phrases. It was very challenging. I often ask myself, how valuable are these sessions where no item is taught at the end? Non-item teaching sessions? If you don't have a product to put on your own menu card, does it have any worth? But being so process-driven myself, I can answer that question. But to most Indian dancers, it is a formal technique training that is enshrined. And so to watch the stiff and diffident participants relax and find themselves sliding on the floor, climbing up and down the stairs with conscious movement while having fun was worthwhile. In praise of open rehearsals. During my recent travels in America, I was able to attend a rehearsal for a music concert. It was at the historical Tabernacle Auditorium of the Mormon Church in Salt Lake City, Utah. The giant organ was a single instrument that stood as an imposing structure bathed in brilliant colors of pink, blue and gold. Organist Richard Elliott introduced the rehearsal and proceeded to play five pieces from a diverse range of composers and styles. 
The international audience of tourists, me included, were told to wait until the end to applaud. We listened. It was a rehearsal structured as a short performance, informal and relaxed. Open rehearsals are rewarding and revealing. Each time, we are able to revisit and build upon ideas and inspirations that emerge. Like several dance and music companies do in North America and elsewhere, the Indian dance ecosystem needs to realize the value of this model. These rehearsal sessions are invaluable to invite discussion and it's a way to make the dance work grow and mature. I wish young artists would pay a more attention uh, with some of the rehearsals that I attended to the pacing and emotional arc of each segment. Beyond the expected speed, agility and good technique that is very evident when young dancers take the stage, they desperately need a third eye as observer slash director. And that is becoming more and more evident. New York, New York. Back in my former hometown, New York City, there was a buzz about the recently concluded Erasing Borders Dance Festival and the upcoming Fall for Dance Festival. In the sight of inclement weather, the offline shows for the EB Festival, the House School and the Digital Dance Festival was also very well received. Vijoyani Satpati has been chosen to receive the prestigious Dance Magazine Award and tickets for a city centre performance are already sold out. Malavika Sarukai addressed the New York Public Library audience in the Sunil Kothari Memorial Lecture in initiated and sponsored by Rajika Puri. Outside New York, dance premieres continue. Sharmila Mukherjee's choreography on Anuradha Nehru's Kuchipuri Ensemble was a big success. Rama Vaidyanathan begins her US tour soon after the passing of her legendary mother-in-law Guru Saroja Vaidyanathan, which reinforces my statement that the US continues to be the most valuable market for Indian dance. However, it seems to be totally lopsided. It is US money, US presenters, US performances, and the US workshops that pay for the entire lifestyles of many India-based dancers and musicians. And yet, the snobbery and thinly veiled derision against the NRI dancer and musician persists in India. While I do see increased confidence among so many performers in North America, the truth of the matter is there are simply not enough performance opportunities for young dancers here in the USA. Unless there are many more festivals that are curated with a North American dancer at the forefront and center, this lopsided attention paid to India-based dancers will continue and will dishearten and demoralize the US dancer. So it's high time that instead of waiting to be invited to join the powerful table of gatekeepers and presenters, that this young generation create their own table to be able to define themselves through their art and personalities to create a fresh space and to invite others who share their view of art and performance. The final day of September found me in the picturesque town of St. Louis, Missouri to celebrate the wedding of dancer Kiran Rajagopalan and his partner of 15 years, Wesley, a.k.a. Nico. I met them at a chocolate bistro in New York seven years ago, soon after Kiran had returned to the U.S. from India. I am delighted for this wonderful couple and wish that more of you find the partner of your dreams. After all, Dance can be your shadow, your inspiration, your life force, your passion. But to live your life to the fullest potential, you need a partner. Someone who will be your touchstone, your punching bag, your hug pillow and your conscience keeper. Find love and celebrate the festival season. Feel the force of the divine feminine wash over you. As I wind down, news shines through from Minneapolis. My good friend and fellow dreamer, theater maker Deepankar Mukherjee has been chosen to receive the prestigious McKnight Award grant for $100,000. The co-founder of Tangier World Theater, who focuses on artists and writings of color, 
Deepankar is overseeing a brand new theatre space where in his own words, we can stop being treated like children and step into the fullness of our potential as storytellers. Bravo! Until next time, I'm Anita Ratnam. Keep listening. Keep following us on our social media profiles at Nartaki Official on Instagram and Facebook. Bye.